As we mentioned at the beginning of today's liturgy, it is the sixth Sunday of Easter. And so for six, seven weeks, we have been singing alleluias. And I wonder sometimes, since we do these things almost out of practice or what you might say habit, whether we ever really stop to think, why are we using this one word so frequently? Alleluia, alleluia. If I asked you to define it, you'd probably say to me something like, well, it must have something to do with joy. Now, isn't that why you say alleluia? Or does it have something to do with glory? I would dare suggest to you that you might find an insight into the use of the word alleluia, which again is certainly a word that captures the spirit of Easter in the first reading. As uh, Peter is reflecting on an experience that not only he has, but those who are with him are part of that original community. And they have gone into the house of Cornelius. Cornelius, who was a Roman centurion, as far as we know, a member of what would have been the Gentile community. And Peter has been invited there and is sharing with them the good news. But something very dramatic happens. And the dramatic thing that happens is as Peter is speaking with them, he sees and those with him see the Holy Spirit descend upon these people. And they're shocked. They're shocked by what they witness. They're shocked because, and again, these are not people of the tribe. These are not people of the tradition. This is a new group. And in a sense, the Alleluias are the celebration of the new day of God. For that's what Easter is. It's a celebration of the new day of God. When God breaks open the barriers, and not just the barrier of death, certainly that is one of the critical pieces, but the barrier of the prejudices, the barriers of the narrowness, the barriers that were so ingrained in the human culture. He shatters them. And he basically says, there is no tribe. There is one people. One people who live in me. Then he manifests for us by his life, manifested again through the Son who is present among us, just as the scripture says, God so loved the world that he sent his Son to live among us. Not, in a sense, apart from us, but as one with us. And in so doing, he literally makes available to us a new way of life. A way of life captured in that word which is repeated over and over again in the scripture today. He makes open to us a way of love. A way of love that is beyond our comprehension because it is a love of total self-giving. No condition. If there had been conditions, the reality is that Jesus would have never come. Jesus would have never come because the history was a history of literally sitting in the face of God. God's love is so overwhelming 
God's love is so ever-embracing that God is ever able to overlook, overlook our shortcomings and to continue on a journey that God began in creation. We often say we miss so much of the story, the essence of the story of creation because we literally concentrate on Eve and Adam eating of the fruit of the tree. But that is merely a manifestation of the limitness of our humanity. The greater event is that God would come in the cool of the afternoon breeze and God would walk with his creature. But that was God's design. That was God's plan. Not that we be apart, that we be separate, but that we be together. We be at one with God. And in the mystery of God, we would be at one with one another. For we would be literally taken up into the very being of God, the very being of love. So as we come to this sixth Sunday of Easter, the Lord uses it to remind us this is why you are singing Alleluia. Because I have literally broken in your broken and fragile history. And I have offered to you a new road. A new road of love. Born And I have invited all of you, irregardless of who you are, where you are, what you look like, what language you speak, what place you hold in the scale of the society, I invite you to join with me in this new moment and to live this new moment. That's why we have the Eucharist frequently. That's why we have it weekly that we, again, encourage and invite everyone to come to it. Because the Eucharist, the celebration of the Eucharist, is the celebration of living in God's life. And it's manifested in the most concrete way that you could imagine. It's manifested in the fact that when you look around you, you're not just here with your family. You're not just here with your neighbor. You're here with strangers. You're here with people of very different backgrounds. And as we come together and we enjoy the gift of the Lord, there is a prayer. It's the prayer of consecration. Again, we think of that often in terms of the transformation that takes place in the body and blood, in the bread and wine, becoming the body and blood of Christ. But there's a second consecration that takes place shortly thereafter as we pray that the Holy Spirit come upon us as it has come upon, as the Spirit has come upon the bread and wine and transformed it into the body and blood of Christ, we pray that the Spirit come upon us and transform us by the power of the Spirit into the body and blood of Christ. Literally, that we, through the Eucharist, will continue to grow 
in the newness of Jesus' risen life. And that the Eucharist will give to us the strength to live that reality day in and day out, despite all the obstacles, despite all the negativity, despite all the violence, that we will be the faithful remnant that speaks by our actions the love of God in our families, in our communities, ultimately in the world at large. I invite you to stand now that together we may proclaim the faith that brings us to this moment each week.